Uh, the best parallel to American leaders' um, complacency in the face of China's growing military strength and reach is Britain's refusal to listen as Churchill warned throughout the 1930s that the Germans were preparing for another war in Europe. Churchill was no longer minister, but he had very good contacts in and out of government uh, and with German refugees who told him of the massive sums that Germany was spending on its military, uh, on its growing air force, multiplying armor and mechanized divisions, and, uh, and their joint operations that, uh, that we, we know as Blitzkrieg. The British snoozed, and when they were suddenly awakened, um, they had a shield to protect them, and um, that was the United States. Uh, of course, implicit in there is that at the point that we waken, um, we don't have a shield. The parallel between our situation with China and England's with Germany is not perfect. We can't know China's intent, uh, but Churchill described Germany's quite accurately. He said that we were faced with the organized might and will to war of 70 millions of the most efficient race in Europe, longing to regain their national glory and driven in case they faltered by a merciless military, social, and party regime. If Churchill's judgment about German intent could be doubted, every question should have been erased when Hitler reoccupied the Rhineland in 1936. Um, declaring to a credulous British and American public that the move was purely symbolic. Are we as credulous today about China as the English were in the 1930s? I think the answer is yes. <clears throat> a People's Liberation Army Navy fighter collided with an American P-3 over a part of the South China Sea, which we say is in international waters and which China claims. Um, this was in 2001. A diplomatic incident followed. Um, since then, China has continued and accelerated its claims over the international waters of the South China Sea. In 2005, Chinese vessels fired on Vietnamese fishing boats in the South China Sea. Three times in 2009, Chinese vessels interfered with the legitimate surveillance activities of U.S. naval vessels operating in the South China Sea. In 2011, Chinese vessels fired at Philippine fishing boats in the same disputed waters. Later the same year, there were clashes with a Vietnamese energy exploration vessel and then with another hired by the Vietnam Oil and Gas Corporation. The list of incidents the following year is too long to relate here but involve vessels of the Indian Navy, uh, the Philippine Navy, um, as well as a statement by, uh, the, a Chinese, by China's foreign ministry spokesman, uh, Jin Gong, that, quote, China had absolute sovereignty over the South China Sea and its many islands. In April this year, uh, long-standing Chinese claims over Japan's Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea resulted in encounters between ships of both states, and Japanese Prime Minister Abe's statement in the Diet recently that Japan was prepared to use force if China uh, landed on the disputed islands. So China's actions since 2001 um, are a pattern of aggressive behavior in international waters, they threaten its neighbors. They challenge a fundamental U.S. principle of freedom of navigation in international waters, over which the U.S. took military action against Libya in 1986. And they also illustrate uh, China's willingness to use force to achieve its political objectives. A former senior U.S. military officer in the region uh, mentioned to me earlier this week that uh, China is on an inexorable quest to resume their Middle Kingdom status in about 17 years. Um, the middle in Middle Kingdom is not a geographic reference, um, it's a power reference. Um, dynasties came and went, but China's leaders saw themselves as the central power in the region, if not the world. Sort of the same way that the Earth was once viewed 
as the place in the universe around which everything else turned. Beijing's military buildup, their diplomacy, the actions they've taken at sea, and their powerful desire to the scales which they regard as having been tipped against them in the era, era of European colonization, all suggest that the senior U.S. military officer, retired officer's understanding is accurate. At the same time, uh, and this is, eh, we sort of forget this one. No, we don't, but the administration does. Uh, and uh, Congress bears some responsibility as well. Uh, China is a tyrannical political regime. Secretary of State Kerry's first official report on human rights noted that uh, the Communist Party is the highest and sole authority in the land. He said that, re quote, repression and coercion, particularly against organizations and individuals involved in rights advocacy and public issues are routine, end of quote. Uh, the secretary listed police beatings and torture that had resulted in deaths. Uh, the report noted that defendants in criminal proceedings were executed following convictions that lacked the process, due process and adequate channels for appeal. The report lists the disappearance of those who petitioned the government, the extraction of confessions by torture, the placement of petitioners and activists in mental institutions. Does anybody remember the Soviet Union? Um, it notes that the Vice Minister of Health, Huang Jifu, um, has promised uh, to end within three to five years the harvesting of human organs for transplant from death row prisoners. And what does this have to do with American security? Everything. <clears throat> the history of the past century is a lesson in the danger of combining despotic regimes with armed ones. The Soviets and the Nazis are the two best-known examples. The accelerating curve of Germany's pre-World War II armament and that of China's deserve careful attention. Germany was effectively disarmed at the end of the First World War. Two decades later, they were able to take on Europe, Russia, and the United States. The Chinese are nowhere close to this today, but they've come a long way since the days of Deng Xiaoping. When China's Navy was a coastal force equipped with patrol boats that could stay at sea for a day or two, if that. Um, since then, the Navy, the Chinese Navy, has experienced, and the Army, the entire Chinese military apparatus, has received uh, experience decades of uninterrupted double-digit annual budget increases. This has produced the single largest fleet of major surface combatants, including amphibious ships and submarines, in Asia. China is modernizing its current nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines as it plans for the next generation of the same boat, which is expected to carry missiles with a range of over 4,000 nautical miles. Similar effort is going into nuclear-powered attack submarines, of which four variants of the, moder of the modernized class are now being constructed. The Chinese Navy continues to rely heavily on diesel-powered attack submarines, which, while they lack the range of nuclear-powered boats, are quieter, they're harder to detect, and more than sufficient for operations intended to establish by force China's claims to the South China Sea. The Chinese Navy's surface ship construction program is equally robust including the recent commissioning of its first aircraft carrier. China is planning a new class of destroyers with far more offensive capability than its predecessor. The Navy is building guided missile frigates, a new generation of guided missile destroyers, and planning now for its successor, which will carry the, the Navy's first vertical launch missile system, which is capable of firing anti-ship and land attack cruise missiles, as well as surface-to-air missiles and anti-submarine missiles. In sum, China is an authoritarian, single-party regi regime that routinely and brutally suppresses its own people. It has accelerated its aggressive behavior to establish claims over international waters, 
and transformed its fleet from a coastal patrol force into a blue water navy. This transformation is a large part of China's asymmetrical strategy that is intended to deny the U.S. fleet access to the waters of the Western Pacific and thus, at a very minimum, separate us from our five treaty allies in the region. How have we reacted? Well, China systematically trods on its own people's human rights. Our officials bring up the issue at diplomatic fora. The deep concern that characterized U.S. policy toward the Soviet Union, towards their human rights abuses, as expressed by both the executive and legislative branches and by members of both political parties, is today regarding China all but absent. Democrats, uh, I'm sorry, demarches and letters of protest, we send them, but not much more. We speak softly and we carry a twig. The Pentagon, not the White House, or even the State Department accused China in May of cyber attacks against the U.S. government and defense contractors. We can hope that these attacks were met with responses in kind, but the administration, this administration, is famously diffident about promising consequences or keeping such promises once they're made. The increasing volume of commerce between the U.S. and China blinds us to the growing challenge Beijing represents as surely as the British people's exhaustion after World War I prevented them from a clear-eyed view of German misbehavior at home, the relatively minor predations in Europe that preceded the invasion of Poland, and armed preparations for World War II. Our commercial relationship obfuscates the reality that while Beijing sees a strategic element in its relations with Washington, we act as though the balance of trade, intellectual property infringements, and currency valuations are the exclusive core of our relations with China. And while China is expanding its naval forces, what are we doing? We are dismantling ours. The current administration has already, had already cut its defense spending by nearly $500 billion before sequestration. If a solution to sequestration is not found, the total decrease in the Defense Department budget under the current administration will amount to around a trillion dollars. The long-term result will lead toward a fleet in 2043 of fewer than 200 ships or about one-third smaller than the approximately 284-ship fleet we have today. With less than a year since sequestration took effect, uh, Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Greener told the House Armed Services Committee uh, on April 16th of this year that sequestration would increase the fraction of the fleet that is not ready for combat to two-thirds. In norm, its normal level of unpreparedness is a half, which is the expected anticipated result uh, of scheduled maintenance and repairs. In the same testimony, Admiral Greenert said of sequestration, a quote, sequestration and the lack of an appropriations bill, his primary concern is the impact they have on readiness in this fiscal year. Make no mistake, he pointed out, it's going to have an irreversible and debilitating effect on the Navy's readiness through the rest of this decade. We will not be able to respond in the way the nation has expected and depended, end of quote. America's reaction to China's armament and patterns of using coercive force in the West Pacific bears a striking similarity to Britain's in the 1930s. The British were unwilling to take seriously Germany's military buildup and the pattern of using its forces that began in the middle of that decade and culminated in the invasion of Poland in 1939. With Germany and China, once powerful nations sought redress for what they regarded as recent historical grievances. In each case, the major power that could have deterred dangerous ambition, chose to look in another direction and failed to respond with an armaments program that signaled resolve. 
Churchill was surely right in his assessment that effective English and French rearmament, along with resolute diplomacy or a minimum of force, could have avoided the conflict that turned into World War II. Both Germany's and China's rulers respect power. In our time, conflict with China, I don't believe, is inevitable. But leadership from behind, massive cuts in our military, and largely symbolic expression of rebalancing toward Asia will not earn the respect of China's rulers. They are more likely to encourage additional aggressive behavior, and this will lead to increasingly troubled relations between the United States and China. Thank you, and if I can answer your questions, I'll do my best. Wonderful. Uh, Seth, thank you for really an extraordinarily impressive presentation on an extraordinarily important topic. Um, if I may just ask one quick question. The civilian's attitude towards all of this is uh, perhaps benighted, but not altogether surprising under the present administration. Congress somewhat less so. But um, what is mystifying, I must say, is uh, the position taken, for example, by the uh, commander of the Pacific Forces in the Pacific at this point, uh, to the effect that global warming is the greatest challenge that he faces in the region. Um, would you speak to where the United States Navy is in all of this as a leadership and as an organization? Well, <clears throat> I hate to... <laughs> We'll leave it to you to get down I, on I hate to, uh, you know, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, um, the president is commander-in-chief, and the, uh, the, the service chiefs have to get in line. The alternative is to get out of line, which means uh, stepping down from the greasy pole that you've spent your whole career trying to climb. Um, that's not part of our tradition. I don't know what else I can answer, how else I can answer that question. But, uh, well, maybe Ace, you have no, a better no, I, answer. I, I get that. But, but just on the, on the specific question of a threat assessment, I mean, that's, that's a matter of professional judgment. That's not simply toadying up to politicians. Um, there was a time, I don't think you were in it, but you were certainly of this character, where there was a revolt of the admirals. I uh, remember, you know, that being the the brand. It wasn't the generals; it was the admirals who revolted. Yeah. Um, he was in uniform then. He was in uniform then. Anyway, I just I I, I don't want to belabor the point. Ace, do you want to uh, add a, a quick comment on it, and then we'll open it up? No. No. Okay. Questions or Seth. I thought, have I shot your wad? Do you want to say anything further? About yeah. Uh, no, look, I, um, I think that over the, in talks with um, admirals over the past few years, uh, it's active, clear. Active duty? Yeah. It's clear that um, concern about China has increased, and people will say so privately. And I, I think many of you know about the Chinese effort to build a missile that can hit an American aircraft carrier underway at sea. And where this idea was scoffed at eight years ago, it's taken seriously today. Um, and you see that in um, more bureaucratic than operational efforts as represented by the air-sea battle. Uh, but that's not really a war plan. That's a kind of a, how do we kind of work things out and, you know, how do we coordinate and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but Ace, I, I see you want to get the Well, let me say, he's the mic'd up. battle is just like Carter's rapid deployment force. It's, it's all a paper uh, exercise. It, from a war fighting potential, it doesn't mean a damn thing. I, there are so many areas that I would like to comment on, but I'm going to take the first one. Point, the, point that the at your mouth a little bit summit, more, Ace. Can you hear it? That's better. Yeah. In the recent summit, our illustrious leader 
when the Chinese president brought, stated out their position on the South China Sea, I think our leader passed. I've seen nothing where he stated the United States position, which has gone on for over 236 years, freedom of navigation and right of innocent passage. And, and unless we really uh, stick with that um, international recognized law, if you will, uh, we're going to lose. Yeah, but Ace, you're, you're not taking into account um, the, uh, the administration's statement yesterday that they were going to revoke trading privileges um, with Bangladesh. Um, because of, well, yeah, uh, that Bangladesh yes. Navy, you got to watch out for it. Let yeah, me, yeah, yeah, you got. So it's not thing, like we, we're not tough. It's just and, you know, here the the stupid statements on North Korea. We're both for a denuclearized North Korea. So what has China just done? Sold them six of the sixteen wheel tells, which enhances North Korea's capability to launch an attack on us. I mean. You know, I can go on and on and on. This, I don't know what to do with this administration because uh, really they're sabotaging us from within. Mm. And I've got an op-ed on that, which should be out early next week. Hot dog. I'll let that go. Admiral Lyons, just so you all know, is uh, formerly commander of the Pacific Fleet, so he's been dealing with the Chinese for a long time. Steve? Thanks, Frank. Uh, Seth, one of the issues that we've debated uh, – around this table, and I've spoken on several times over the last uh, five years, is the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And a lot of those, the proponents of U.S. ratification of that treaty uh, see it as a cure-all uh, for what ails us uh, with China in the South China Sea and, and elsewhere, uh, that is, if we join the convention, all of these problems that we have regarding navigational rights and freedoms will uh, go away. And, uh, you know, if there's trouble, we can just bring China to uh, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea and get it all sorted out there. Um, I was wondering if you had any views on U.S. ratification of uh, the Law of the Sea Treaty and whether it would have any effect on, on the problems that you've uh, pointed out. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that uh, – <laughs> I think we're going down the same straight uh, with this administration. And – uh, the fact is that the Navy has been in favor of the of UNCLOS for a long time. Um, the Navy is not as concerned uh, as um, other, as I think it should be, uh, with um, with the commercial elements of the of um, that remain problematic about the the law of the sea uh, law, law law of the sea treaty. Um, it's not particularly concerned about the idea that uh, American corporations should be required to share the profits that they make from seabed mining um, with countries that have no coastline. Um, it seems to me as though that's unreasonable. Um, and, uh, uh, and also the, the uh, China is using the uh, – um, exclusive economic zones that are part of UNCLOS um, as a partial justification for its territorial claims in the South China Sea. And you can make the argument, well, they're going to use whatever they need to, and in the end, they're going to use force if they, if they can't find the legal justification. But I don't think that the Navy's position takes that into account. As you know very well, Steve, of course, China is a party to the Law of the Sea Treaty, and their claims about sovereignty in the South China Sea do not conform to their obligations under the treaty. Any other questions, quickly, before we move on? One. I'm sorry, Ben. <laughs> uh, Seth, a few months ago, there was a report that came out about China's UAV, or drone, program. And uh, it got into some of the tactics that China is exploring with respect to how to deploy a drone against our Navy. And uh, I was wondering if you had any comments on China's drone program and the extent to which the Navy should be concerned or is concerned about that particular threat. Well, I, I think there are signs that um, uh, that ideas which uh, would not have been on the table 
um, on the Navy's table 15 years ago um, are now on the table, especially um, regarding uh, UAVs. Uh, that's a hopeful sign. I mean, I, the, the nuclear submarine community is willing to entertain the idea of UAVs um, that are operated by diesel propulsion. Um, Fifteen years ago, I don't, I don't think that would have gotten that hearing. Submersibles. Yeah, submersibles, absolutely. Um, it's a long step to actual manned submersibles that are powered by diesel electric, but... Um, those are, generally speaking, good signs. Um, uh, the Chinese, um, as you know, are really good at copying things. Um, and when they get to it eventually, um, there's no reason. I mean, I think that they'll have as they'll, they'll have an advanced technology base that does not require copying in order to move forward substantially. Um, they have it in their culture going back th thousands and thousands of years. Um, so I expect that they will uh, use as full an array of UAVs, um, surface, subsurface, and, air and airborne, as they possibly can to accomplish their immediate objective, which is uh, keeping us out of the Western Pacific.